Welcome to the Off the Charts Football Podcast. I'm Matt Manicharian from Sports Info Solutions, joined by Corey March today. We've also got our producers, Justin Stein and Mark Simon, with us. Today, we are talking about fantasy football, previewing the season, and going where no other fantasy analysts have gone before. And for that purpose, we've got Corey March here. Corey runs the business development operation at Sports Info Solutions, but is also our foremost fantasy expert. Corey, what's happening, man? Hey, Matt. Good to be back again. It's the first time I've joined you since my wife and I had a baby. So a lot's been going on on my end. Welcome, baby Violet, to the world. Uh, it's been a lot, but I've been able to uh, stay up to date on everything happening in football. But I will say my diet is mostly coffee. So. And where's, uh, where's Violet in terms of fantasy strategy? Is she like zero RB? Like, what's her deal? Uh, TBD. She has not seen a football game yet. So I think her, her opinions are still in the, the primitive phase. I don't know. I know lots of people that have never seen football games that have opinions. So I don't think that she would be out of line to have an opinion of her own based on some of the stuff you, you hear on the internet. If she's related to me, then her opinions will be very statistical and fact-based. So. so she's not watching preseason, huh? No, no. And that's something we'll get into. We don't want to overreact to preseason. So I'm trying to keep her away from those preseason act, that preseason action. I, she's been dying to watch, though. Let's jump into it today. We're previewing the whole fantasy season, and we're diving into some interesting topics that are kind of the topics du jour selected by Corey. So first bit, you mentioned it a little bit there, preseason underreactions. What do you mean when you say preseason underreactions? So I wanted to do the opposite of what everybody else seems to be out there doing, uh, which is overreacting to what we're seeing in these preseason games. It, it's easy to do and it's fun to do just because it's all that we have access to right now. But I think the past has been an indication that these are more just opportunities to spotlight young players and not get guys hurt more than anything. It's also weird with with just three weeks. Like I'm I'm not fully sure that the league has leveled out in terms of how they're treating each of the weeks of the preseason. I think that's still something that's kind of inefficient and that makes it even more weird uh, as we try to figure out what's going on out there. Yeah, I agree with that. And same will go for the regular season. I imagine teams are just going to go all in for all 17 games, but who knows? There could be some strategy at play there. Yeah. I mean, I think we've already seen the Patriots treat the first quarter of the season like it's a sort of an extension of the preseason for years, which is why you should never be uh, concerned when a Belichick team starts off slowly unless Brady's not their quarterback anymore, which happens to still be the case. I think that as the season gets longer, you could see more more teams kind of playing the long game in terms of not trying to be at full strength on week one, as you might have been in years past. The Patriots in particular probably don't have the luxury to take the start of the season lightly anymore. They need to be out there trying their best to win every game. Oh, yeah. And they're going to try to bludgeon teams this year. I was watching Judon flash on the TV screen last night. He looked pretty good in that number nine jersey for the, for the Patriots. So uh, definitely a bright spot there. I did have Patriots money line in that game. So shout out to me. All right. Shout out to you. Let's start the underreactions. But how can you possibly underreact to Trey Lance? I see you've got it listed here on the first on our rundown. Everybody saw that throw. Everybody saw just the physical ability that was on display right there. People started throwing around Mahomes already in describing him. Why do you think that that we should underreact to what we've seen from Trey Lance? Definitely an exciting player. Don't get me wrong. But I like like I said, I think it's easy to overreact. I think Trey Lance is the type of player like we assessed in the draft uh, process that is capable of big plays just like that, but it still has a very raw skill set. And for me... I think that Jimmy Garoppolo gives the, the team the best chance to win out of the gate and let Trey Lance stay on the sideline, continue to develop for a little while, plug him in when the time is right. But I think they'd be best suited to win games with Jimmy Garoppolo from week one. That's just my take. But back to Trey Lance and his fantasy outlook. Well, no, no, I think no. But on that point, uh, we can look at the Bears and we can say, I think most people think that Justin Fields gives the Bears the best chance to win games, probably even in week one based on kind of where the what we don't know about him and what we do know about Andy Dalton, I don't think you can say the same thing about San Francisco. I don't think it's even that situation where I don't, I think the bears should go ahead and start Dalton probably just because it's a lot easier to go from Dalton to fields than to go back in the other direction. Unless they're really, really sure, unless it's Russell Wilson, uh, Matt Flynn, 
then I think you go with the veteran to start just because there's kind of only good things can happen if you go in that direction. Whereas if you start the rookie and then you've got to pull him for some reason, then I think you're in trouble. But Trey Lance isn't even that situation. This isn't a guy who's ready based on anything that we've seen. The Niners barely had anything going in the spring in terms of having enough practices for him to possibly be ready. I know it was a pretty play, but I don't know. I, 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 I thought we were brushing over that point a little bit, but I find it very unlikely that he would start week one. I think he'll play, but I, unlikely that he'll start. We're on the same page there. And his ADP, his average draft position, is up two rounds from where it was last month, from the 14th round to the 12th round. When you're getting that late in drafts, it's not a bad investment to take a flyer on a guy who has that tremendous upside. But at the same time, you can't be relying on him um, if he's going to be on the bench for the start of the season. So you'd need to pair him with a more stable option, um, ideally one you don't have to spend an earlier pick on than what you're spending to get Lance in the 12th. So that could mean Kirk Cousins or Ryan Fitzpatrick if you're looking for a safe option or someone like Baker Mayfield or Tua if you're looking for more upside. Yeah, I think you're spot on. I think his fantasy skill set, like if and when he becomes a starter, which I think will happen at some point. I don't know if it's this year or not, but, you know, obviously they drafted him for a reason and they really believe in all of his physical ability. And it's, it's exciting to see it on display. But based on I mean, when you go back to this, the evaluation on this player This is somebody who just played one game last year. Besides that, he's played one full season, really, of low-level college football. Very impressive in terms of, uh, you know, as a ball carrier, I think he's got running back type of talent. And in terms of arm talent, I'd put him right up there. Um, In terms of, you know, some of the the top quality, like arm strength and ability to make any throw that that you'll see out there. But in terms of putting it all together, this this is a long ways away. And I think that I think they use him as a Taysom Hill, as as kind of a gadget at at first. Once he gets into that in that role, though, I mean, if if we're seeing Jalen Hurts as attractive fantasy quarterback, this this guy has everything that he has, and then more in terms of what the upside could be there. I'm not saying it's all going to pan out, but if it does, he could be he could be a freaky fantasy player. I'm just not ready to bet on that happening this season. Right, and in terms of overreacting, I've seen everybody talking about that bomb touchdown and nobody talking about the fact that he was four for 13. Otherwise I could see him putting him on the field though. I could see it's doing some double passes, stuff like that. Uh, I, I don't, I don't put it past them. I think that that Shanahan's smart and I think he's got the long-term vision and my guess is that he sees it that way too. I'm a fan of that type of stuff. I believe the future of football is going to be that. I think you're going to see two quarterback skill set guys, athletic quarterback skill sets on the field at the same time. I, I think it's a matter of time before uh, we realize that that we're being inefficient by not doing that. So that's been a theory of mine for a while now, but I think we'll maybe we'll need to have a, a separate podcast about that one. Back to this podcast. Next guy that everybody wants to overreact to is Ramondre Stevenson. Ramondre Stevenson, Corey, are you overreacting, underreacting? I'm not buying into the hype so easily. Uh, he's been on the field a ton. We've gotten two games worth of Patriots action now. And he's been, he's had 25 carries. He, he sparked with a 91 yard touchdown. Again, that's the one that everybody wanted to talk about, but nobody's talking about that. Otherwise he's averaging, you know, a pretty pedestrian three and a half to four yards per carry. And the fact that he's just out there gobbling up carries is a pretty good indication. I think that he's more locked into being a reserve player than being an every down player like Damian Harris, you see him out there sparingly, uh, the team trying to avoid getting him too much exposure and potentially avoiding injury. You know, I, I look at the Patriots running back situation and I, and I think that based on how they've used their running backs in the past, I, I wouldn't get too excited about anybody. Now, if you can get him cheap, I think it's kind of interesting, but this was our 10th ranked running back in the football rookie handbook this past year, not graded as a starting level player, graded as a role playing starter who especially can excel on third downs. And the reason for that is because he has solid hands and he can get by as a pass blocker, which is a rare thing to find when you've got rookies coming out. The Patriots grading scale, I know is very similar to the grading scale that we use at SIS. They're different versions of, of something that started from the same original piece. And that third down ability and the ability to pass block specifically is something that we're going to really value in both of our scales because of the versatility that allows you on the field. So I can see this player becoming a Bill Belichick type favorite player because he's got toughness, he's got versatility, play on all three downs, and you can trust him on third down 
whether it's a run situation, he can get inside yardage, pass situation, he can catch the ball, or he can pass block a little bit. But 91-yard touchdown run aside, I, I think he's got a little bit of a lack of juice. And for that reason, I don't see super high upside. And the way that they like to rotate their backs, I'd be more surprised if what we're seeing in the preseason really carries over into the regular season. I think he's he's just a part of their committee at the end of the day. And, you know, in so much as he has value there, maybe if this becomes a real pass catcher, if he starts to do the stuff that we've seen some third down backs do for the Patriots. But I'd be surprised if he got that role right off the bat. Yeah, on the same page. I think a long-term prospect, but if we're talking about redraft leagues, I, I don't think he's going to contribute much or any value to your team this year. So rather than have him on your roster, taking up a, a space at the beginning of the season, and like we said, for most of the season, it's unlikely for him to make major contributions that justify putting him in your lineup. You're better off spending that roster spot on somebody else. All right, let's move forward and let's talk about one more overreaction that people are having. Salvin Ahmed in the Dolphins' backfield, which is a sort of Crappy backfield, sort of crowded backfield. It's it's one of the two or somewhere in between at least, but he's starting to get drafted pretty high. What are you seeing in terms of that, that whole backfield situation and, and specifically as it applies to, to Salvin Ahmed? Yeah, I don't think any of those three guys, especially where they're getting drafted, are very appealing. It's Gaskin, Malcolm Brown, and Salvin Ahmed. But after that week one performance, I was hearing some hype. He was the most effective back in their in their preseason week one game. Similar to to Stevenson, he was getting more of that later in the game, uh, second team work. Malcolm Brown, I saw him as more of a threat since he was out there playing first team snaps, but he wasn't staking a claim to the job with nine carries for eight yards. I think Gaskin's the guy who's going to be in the starting role playing the, the highest percentage of snaps. He played 10 games last year. And when he did, uh, he was on the field for 68% of the snaps. And I could see that translating into this year. Yeah, I think you're spot on there. I think Askins the guy that they that they trust the most right now. I think all three of them will play at different times. And last year, there were just so many injuries in the Dolphins' backfield that, that it just became one guy after another. When Ahmed played last year, he showed, you know, I talked about Stevenson maybe not having the most juice. Ahmed had what we would call juice in the scouting community He can go a little bit there and he can be an interesting guy, but I don't think he can carry a heavy workload. So I think that he stays as kind of their change of pace back. Whoever's the one that's getting, you know, those, those first and second down carries and is the main feature guy. Like, like you said, I think it's likely Gaskin. I think that Ahmed can fill that role in spot duty, but I think if you ask him to have 20 carries for multiple weeks in a row, you're going to see what you saw last year, which, which was him not having the, the body to hold up like that. So I think they can be a little bit smarter try to keep Ahmed on a pitch count, have him have some high quality snaps when he's in there, but not rely on him to be the every down back. And for that reason, you know, maybe in the 15th round, an interesting flyer to take, especially if one of those top guys gets hurt. But I'm with you. I'm kind of skeptical about investing too much in any of these guys. I think a lot of it depends on if that offense takes a step forward as a unit, they could potentially prop up somebody into that high RB2, low RB1 category if somebody ends up getting the bulk of the workload best case scenarios like Waddle and Fuller just change the shape of the offense that they have there to a, all of a sudden takes just a huge step this year. And then all of a sudden, if you have a productive offense, whoever's getting the carries there can be an interesting player kind of asking for a lot to happen. <laughs> right. All right, let's move ahead and let's get into our next segment. That is ADP misreads. A startup off the bat where average draft position got it wrong. First one up, Daryl Henderson. I think there's a reason for this one, but uh, what can you tell us about the running back situation in Los Angeles? With Henderson, because I think this one is the most egregious, and I want to tell you why. So he is being drafted at the end of the fifth round right now, which is up significantly from where he was being drafted in the 10th round before Cam Akers was injured. Prior to that, while Henderson was being drafted in the 10th, Cam Akers was being drafted 15th overall, so at the beginning of the second round. At that point, when they were both healthy, Akers was likely to share carries with Henderson. Now Henderson seems like reports are are coming out that he has the reins. Xavier Jones is the backup, but unproven. You can make the argument that Darrell Henderson is a better back than Cam Akers. I know Akers has more draft capital invested in him him by the team and better pedigree based on his recruiting and, and, and college um, profile, but Henderson was explosive at Memphis. He had a, a 22% boom rate in his final season at Memphis, 
which was the highest among all running backs in the last three seasons. And that boom rate is saying big play rate plays that, it, that make more than one expected points added for your team. So that, that's a big play stat. Uh, Michael Carter was second. Javante Williams was third. So it gives you a sense that there are some big names up there at the top of that leaderboard. Hopefully they translate those guys translate into the NFL. But I wanted to point out a similar scenario, hypothetically, if this played out in Dallas and Ezekiel Elliott was out for the season, I'm very sure we'd be looking at Tony Pollard as a second round pick. And based on some of the, the, the metrics out there, the Rams are projected for 10 and a half wins, which is more than the Cowboys projected at nine wins. You could take that even a step further. Uh, DraftKings has a, a prop bet, which team is most likely to score the most points in the league. And the Rams and the Cowboys are basically even. So you can't really point at the Cowboys and say, oh, they're a much more dynamic offense. They're a better team. In both of those categories, they're not. And Henderson was the better college player of the two. They both happen to play at Memphis, and Henderson put up better numbers. So I think Henderson being drafted in the fifth round, if you can get him there, definitely grab him. But he's somebody that I would try and make sure you get on your team, either if it's reaching up to get him in the fourth round. Yeah, the thing that I love that you called out about Daryl Henderson at Memphis is that he was such a good zone running back at Memphis. He was so good in those zone blocking schemes. And I mean, that's obviously what the Rams want to do basically all the time. They want to run you zone to death against you, that outside zone play, and keep hitting you with it and then get their play action working off of it. Uh, I think they're going to be better because they have, they're going to have better quarterback play this year. And I think that Henderson, like you mentioned, fits just as well. It's, it's you know, I'm not saying anything negative against Cam Akers, but Daryl Henderson, I think, is right there in terms of being a top quality back in terms of what they're looking to do. He can catch passes as well, you know, 2.8 yards per route run his last year at Memphis as well. So there are a lot of things that really fit in well. Ben Hurkacz, in fact, in the Football Rookie Handbook 2018, the first line of his run game summary on Henderson is that in the run game, he's best on stretch plays where he can probe the defense and explode. He has very good vision and knows when to put his foot in the ground and get upfield. This is exactly the type of running back that fits into their scheme. The only concern that I have is that putting the full workload load on him is a lot to ask of a back of his stature. And so I think for that reason, they're trying to figure out who the other people that are going to share some carries with him are. And also for that reason, our injury model uh, has flagged him as somebody that could be a high risk to get injured, especially if that workload increases from where he's been in the past. But aside from injury concerns, which Newsflash, we should have injury concerns about any running back. I'm with you. I think that this is an undervalued player and, and maybe still undervalued somehow, assuming he can gobble up some of that workload. Right. Yeah. With, with the injury risk in, in consideration, I would, I would recommend grabbing uh, Xavier Jones late in the draft, pair him as handcuff. Super handcuff situation. Maybe, maybe you have to overdraft the handcuff just a little bit, but, but it's probably worth doing in this case because if you have the the Rams running back situation on lockdown, you're going to be in pretty good shape. 100%. All right. Let's talk to another one that ADP got wrong. That's Damian Harris. What did AP, ADP screw up about Damian Harris? So we were talking about this backfield a bit earlier. Damian Harris is slated to go right now in the sixth round ahead of guys like Melvin Gordon and Ronald Jones. Both of those guys that I mentioned are, I would say, in the most likely scenario, or possibly, you know, it's, it's a toss up whether they'll even get the most carries on their team. I think Damian Harris is slated for that two down back plus goal line carries this year. And that goal line carry work could be a lot more valuable than it was last year in New England, depending on who the quarterback is. And we saw a tweet come out yesterday from Tom Curran of NBC Sports Boston, who said Patriots quarterback competition is now Mac versus Mac. And I've seen a lot of people saying that Mac looked better in the preseason, can put up a decent showing yesterday, but you know, a lot of it comes down to who will win that job and, and when will Mac take over. So a lot depends on that. But looking at the numbers last year and the carries around the goal line, the Patriots carry distribution inside the five. Cam Newton had 22 carries. The second most was Rex Burkhead, who's no longer on the team, with four. And then Damian Harris had three. So if you if we're going to redistribute that carry load at the goal line and say, we give the majority of it to Harris and he gets into the end zone at a league average rate from inside the five, you're looking at seven plus touchdowns and he had two last year. So I think ADP is looking at his season last year and his role last year, but that could be significantly changing if Mac Jones is at the helm. 
from an overall perspective, I like Damian Harris. I like the situation there. I think he's their, their number one running back. He was a power back at Alabama. We had him as a strong starter grade. He was the third bank, uh, ranked running back in that class behind just uh, Josh Jacobs and Devin Singletary. Uh, I think he's a really talented runner with the ball is in his hands. can also catch the ball a little bit too. So, so I like what he brings to the table from a skill set perspective as a power back on a team that wants to be a power team, no matter who the quarterback is. What I want to say about this is that a lot of times people that make fantasy or bets, they make fantasy choices or bets, they don't actually know what they're betting on. And if you are betting on Damian Harris or if you are betting against Damian Harris, don't trick yourself into thinking that you're betting on his quality as a football player because that record speaks for itself. This man can carry the football. What we're betting on when we talk about Damian Harris really is what's the New England offense going to be and who's going to be the quarterback? Because, Corey, as you pointed out, his value is mostly dictated. If you just if you just lay things out in terms of all the facts that we know, his value is mostly going to be dictated by whether or not he gets those touchdowns or not. And the thing that's going to decide whether or not he gets those touchdowns is going to be, number one, how good the New England offense is, which is coming down to the quarterback, and number two, who that quarterback is. Most importantly, who that quarterback is. Because if it is Cam Newton, he's going to gobble up a bunch of those touchdowns. And so really, if you're betting on Damian Harris and comparing him to, to what other people think he is, what you're doing really is you're making a, a case about who the New England quarterback's going to be and how they're going to perform in that role. So this is, a, this is an example where I think it's really easy to think you're betting on Damian Harris, the player. But in actuality, if you're engaging in buying or selling against the market here, what you're doing is really thinking about who that quarterback's going to be. And for people that are, that are thinking about investing in this player, I'd just like you to acknowledge that that's actually what, what you're doing, because that, that's going to help you make a much better decision. Yeah, that's a great way to look at it. And well said, I think in summary, if you think Mac Jones is going to be the quarterback out of the gate or for the majority of the season, then you should make Damian Harris a target at his sixth round ADP or even reach for him a little bit into the fifth round. Uh, but if you think it's going to be Cam's job for the majority of the season or the or the whole season, then you'll probably want to make Damian Harris a pass. All right. And just because we said all that, we'll probably end up being completely wrong. And Damian Harris will uh, uh, be supplanted on the depth chart. By Ramondre Stevenson. Exactly. One more. ADP getting it wrong on C.D. Lamb. C.D. Lamb, love the player, was a, an interesting rookie year. Uh, what do you got on C.D.? Oh, yeah, this pains me to say because C.D. Lamb is definitely one of my favorite players. And I think the, one of the most exciting players with a, a ceiling that's through the roof. But he's currently being drafted at a third round ADP and in redraft leagues, especially, I think that's a reach. You're likely needing to invest in him as your wide receiver one. And based on what he did last year, he's not going to supply that. Uh, he had two 100 yard games. He had four games where he led Dallas in receiving, which was the same number that Michael Gallup put up. Who's being drafted much later in the drafts. I'm not saying Michael Gallup, Gallup is as good or, you know, the same quality of a fantasy receiver, but an interesting stat. Competing for target shares, for sure. For sure. Um, Amari Cooper had seven games where he led Dallas in receiving last year. And Lamb is being drafted a full round ahead of Cooper. And if you want to look at just the games where Dak played, Amari Cooper had 52 targets and Lamb had 39. So, you know, there's a lot of room for growth. Those were the first few games of C.D. Lamb's career, and he has a, a very bright future ahead of him. But if you're investing in, in him at that point in the draft as your, as your wide receiver one, I think you're better off going another direction. Yeah, I think it's another example of like, what are you betting on? We're not betting on C.D. Lamb, the, the football player. We're just betting on with all of those. What I think Dallas is should be the runaway favorite in that division. I think other NFC East fans are, they make me giggle a little bit when they say like, who should be favored in this terrible division, division and say like the team that actually has a quarterback that's coming back, uh, who's really good. <laughs> But, and I mean, the offensive line for the Cowboys, I think the offense is going to be good this year. The question isn't whether they're going to produce, whether Dak's going to have more than 4,000 yards to all these guys. I think the question is, in terms of target share, is C.D. Lamb just in the third round really worth the value there? Maybe he will be. I think he's probably a good bet to be a thousand yard receiver. So I, I don't hate it. But in terms of where there's value and maybe being able to find find other assets, I think there's something to be said for the fact that that the Cowboys have a lot of guys that are going to be competing for that football. Yeah. And the, the Dak injury scenario is one to keep an eye on. I don't think he's going to miss any regular season time, but it could be something that lingers. You, you always are cautious about it or 
an injury to a quarterback's arm. No doubt about it. All right. Let's uh, take a quick break and then we'll come back and we will talk about some advanced stats for fantasy. The SIS Data Hub Pro is the premier football data tool and your ticket to the winner's circle for your fantasy season or to win your bets this year. You can celebrate the new football season with 20% off by signing up with the promo code KICKOFF at pro.sisdatahub.com. A subscription to the SIS Data Hub Pro gets you our new Tendency Reports tool. You can explore team tendencies with a set of in-depth tools and filters. It includes offense and defense. You can exclude garbage time. You can filter by field position, down and distance, and more. And data goes back to 2018. You definitely want to check that out on the Data Hub Pro. Sign up at pro.sisdatahub.com to receive a free seven-day trial. Again, new users get 20% off their first monthly or annual subscription, and you can take advantage of the offer by visiting the pricing page, entering the coupon code KICKOFF, and this applies to any subscription for NFL, college football, or both. Sign up now. This offer ends on September 13th. You'll want to check it out at pro.sisdatahub.com. All right. Coming back, we're talking about using advanced stats for fantasy purposes. Corey, the foremost expert on using advanced stats for fantasy purposes, what can you tell us about coverage splits for quarterbacks and how we can use that to our advantage? To preface that, I think people in the fantasy community are just starting to to wrap their heads around and and adapt to things like target share and some of the more, more advanced than box score data. But there's really so much more out there that you can incorporate into your models or weekly decisions that I think we should take a look at and give more attention to. And we're going to start with coverage schemes for quarterbacks, like Matt mentioned. Traditionally, there's been a lot of a lot made about home road splits and things like that, but a split that hasn't gotten enough attention, just mainly based on the fact that the data isn't readily available, but something that we collect is man versus zone coverage. It's a really advanced way to get an edge in making streaming quarterback decisions week to week or choosing a quarterback for your DFS lineups each week. A really good example of a a huge coverage splits quarterback is Kirk Cousins. Pretty much looked at as like a middling quarterback, like kind of like an average quarterback among the starting quarterbacks in the league. But when you look at him against man and versus zone, first looking at man, over the past two seasons, he's thrown 31 touchdowns and zero interceptions against man. If you break that out to roughly a game level, 30 attempts, that's 40 fantasy points per game. If he was just facing man coverage, as opposed to when he's facing zone over that same span to last two seasons, he's thrown 26 touchdowns and 15 interceptions breaks down to 28 fantasy points per game. So pretty crazy split there. And just an example of, detailed kind of below the surface level data that can really, really give you some advanced insight into your decision-making that gives you an edge over your opponents. And uh, we'll give you guys a nugget specifically pertaining to Kirk Cousins. Uh, They play Arizona in week two, ranked second in man coverage rate last season. So if that continues, then that may be a matchup to target for fantasy or DFS. Right. And I think it's also worth noting one of the new features that we've released on the Data Hub, all Data Hub Pro subscribers, whether you're a past subscriber, new subscriber, everybody gets access to, it's our Tendency Reports application. And you can use that to really uncover a lot that's going on kind of beneath the surface. Like, what are the, what are the Vikings doing that gets Kirk Cousins in those situations? What can we expect in terms of things? And just by pulling up the Vikings page on the Tendency app, it, it brings up some things that are intuitive, but maybe not, maybe wouldn't have come to mind initially when you think about this. So, in terms of personnel usage, they're last in the NFL in terms of using 11 personnel. And I'm talking about just in 2020 here. Obviously, some good tight ends. They like to run a lot of 12, a lot of 22, a lot of 21 personnel. They're in, they're in the top three in the league in the amount of 21 and 22 personnel that they run. So that's two backs, one tight end, two backs, two tight ends. And they're really good in all of those position groups. So they're not very good in 11. They try to avoid 11. They're really good in bigger personnel groupings, so they try to stay with those bigger personnel groupings, uh, and specifically 12 personnel, where they were second in the league in positive percent last year. That's the one where they really excel. Now, along with that, this is a team that has been kind of known over the past few years for the amount of play action that they incorporate into their things and how that's fit into Kirk Cousins' game and what, and what he's done. 
that actually came down a little bit last year. They were just kind of in the middle of the league in terms of play action usage and some other things that, that you might expect them to be high in, like the amount of time that they use motion, the amount of time that they use no huddle, some of these kind of analytic forward concepts that we see some teams embrace. They actually didn't go in on all that. They ran the least shotgun in the NFL, and that goes along with what we're saying. This is a big personnel team. They want to kind of force you to dictate things. And I think a lot of what, what we're understanding there is that they understand that Kirk Cousins is much better when he gets man coverage. And so what they do is they dictate to the defense that you're going to have to play man against us. So I think what you can continue to see, because it's been consistent, you go back through the years against all man schemes, against all zone schemes, he's just been a much better quarterback against man. And then you'll see what the Vikings do offensively is to try to force defenses to play man against them. So it's, it's that layer that you can take things and, and go a little bit deeper beyond the surface to understand what's really going on when we just say, you know, this quarterback is really good against man. Well, what can we actually expect? For example, you know, when he plays Arizona in week two, uh, as Corey mentioned. Right. And to take it a slightly different direction, but definitely on topic here while we're talking about the Vikings, I think that two tight end preference is a, a team and coaching decision more so than based on their personnel. And they, they don't have Kyle Rudolph anymore. It looks like Tyler Conklin's going to be plugged in a line alongside Irv Smith. And Conklin's just not a pass catching. He's not going to play a huge factor in the passing game. So I think some of that, uh, some of those targets that were going toward to Rudolph specifically, he was a big target in the in the red zone in the end zone. Could go to Irv Smith, and he might be a nice tight end to, to target. Yeah, I love Irv Smith this year, and I wouldn't be surprised also if they did more twenty one. The twenty one now they were third in the league in twenty one usage last year, two backs and one tight end. That that figures like it could be their their main personnel grouping right there again. Now, I mentioned that they're third in twenty one personnel. And last in 11 personnel, they still had two more 11 personnel snaps than 21 personnel snaps. That's how dominant the, the kind of three wide receiver offenses are in the NFL today. I don't think they have the wide receivers to uh, pivot either to more of a three, three wide receiver uh, heavy personnel. Moving ahead, let's look at another stat that we can use to help us sort out our fantasy expectations. And that is the percentage of time that a running back is hit at the line. What can you tell us here, Corey? Yeah, so I think this is a great rushing stat that's not just um, looking at running backs in, in isolation. It, it's really a great way to look at offensive line run blocking, which is a huge factor in, fa- in the ultimate actual fantasy results that are put out by, by these running backs. So an example here, the Steelers ranked last, last, last season, 46% of their carries resulted in their, in their back or their ball carrier getting hit at the line. Washington ranked first. They only had 31% of those carries get hit at the line. It's an interesting comparison because Najee Harris and Antonio Gibson are being drafted essentially back-to-back, 14th overall ADP and 15th overall ADP. So an interesting caveat there. Um, Say both running backs were to carry the ball 200 times with the same hit hit at the line rates as last year. Harris would get hit behind the line 30 more times than Gibson would. And the numbers show us that when running backs get hit behind the line, they average one yard per carry versus if a running back makes it clean to the line and beyond the line, they're averaging 6.2 yards per carry. So breaking that out, looks like Gibson has a lot more opportunities to get clean through the line and pick up more yards than, than Harris. It's just an interesting comparison. Yeah, I mean, three Steelers as a team, 3.6 yards per attempt last year. And the Washington football team, four yards per attempt last year. And you point out how much that comes down to the percentage of the time that you're getting hit before you get to the line of scrimmage. The the corollary to that is if we want to look at it in terms of running back talent, and if for some reason we wanted to anticipate that the offensive lines might change, but we wanted to understand how much the backs were actually responsible. If you flip it on its head like that, the Washington football team was 18th in the NFL in terms of their running backs created broken and missed tackles, just 12 and a half percent of runs had a broken and missed tackle or per attempt, I should say. Whereas the Steelers were up at eighth in the NFL, 15.3 broken and missed tackles per per attempt. So a a much higher rate there, ranking them eighth as opposed to 18th. But if you're not, if you're getting hit before you get to the line of scrimmage, that's going to make it really hard to be a productive rushing offense. So uh, by breaking things down into their parts, we can start to understand, okay, how much of this is offensive line? How much of this is running back? And this is a lot of what total points does as well in terms of inter- interpreting this sort of thing. One thing I like to look at using the Data Hub Pro, it's not 
a column in itself, but I like to subtract the hit at the line percentage minus the stuff percentage for running back. So what percentage of the time did they pick up no yards or lose or lose yardage to get a look at, you know, if these running backs are getting hit behind the line, are they able to overcome that and, and not lose yardage? It looks like, I don't know if you've run it recently. It looks like the Saints are, are kind of leaps and bounds ahead there. Most teams you see like a 20% difference in terms of being hit at the line minus stuffed and the Saints are up close to 30% difference. So sounds like their running backs are doing a lot to get them out of trouble. Let's move to one more and let's talk about intended air yards. Corey, how can we use intended air yards to, to understand which receivers are going to be valuable uh, and which, which guys are going to be busts? So intended air yards is one that's starting to gain the proper amount of attention it has over the past few seasons, thanks to uh, guys like Josh Hermsmeyer and his air yards by low model. But this stat is just something that's helpful to find under the radar receivers. It emphasizes opportunity over results, which is a predictive way to find breakout potential. We'll look at some of last year's numbers. Calvin Ridley led the league with 2,124 intended air yards, which means that in an average game, passes were thrown to him that traveled 134 yards in the air, which is a lot and a lot more opportunity popping up there in Atlanta too. So definitely a guy to keep an eye on, somebody who's racking up intended air yards. One way to take it a step further is by looking at intended air yards versus completed air yards, which translates to who left the most air, air yards on the table. And Chase Claypool had the most last year. He had 1,127 air yards that fell incomplete. So over 1,000 air yards that, that were incomplete and only 537 that were actually caught. So figure in his second year, better rapport with, with Big Ben. A lot of, you know, hopefully a, a percentage of those translate into actual um, caught air yards. We actually also saw that Chase Claypool had a lot of defensive pass interferences called on him last year too. So if some of those translate into catches, it seems like his actual results versus his, we'll call them expected results, didn't necessarily translate. He was more of an expected points guy than actual points guy. So somebody with high potential to keep an eye on in this year's drafts. One thing beyond that, a third thing I'll mention here with, with air yards is intended air yards team share. So three players were tied atop the leaderboard last year having been the target of 40% of their team's total air yards. It's Calvin Ridley, who we mentioned, DK Metcalf, who's an air yard machine in Seattle, and Marquise Brown, who is basically at the post-hype point of his career. He's had two years that did not meet expectations, but he had a ton of air yards. He was on the, on the hook for a ton of his team's air yards. As a team, Baltimore doesn't throw for as many air yards as Atlanta or uh, Seattle. But if they do and they ramp that number up a little bit and more of those connect with Marquise Brown, easy upside there, especially in the 11th round of fantasy draft. So somebody to keep an eye on as a later round flyer. And also, like if you want to win in daily fantasy, high upside guys are huge. And these are all high upside players kind of kind of any week of the year based on what they're doing. I, I look to this in a little bit of a different way than you. I would just look at things straight up in terms of who's running the most deep routes. So who ran goes, posts, corners, the seven, eight, and nine routes, and then deep double moves, anything, uh, a hitch and go, uh, post corner, et cetera, anything like that. So in terms of just the number of total routes run last year, and then the, the number of targets that they received on those, you're absolutely right. Calvin Ridley first in terms of the number of targets, he was 31 targets on those, but 134 routes run. There were actually 10 players that ran more vertical routes than Calvin Ridley. And these are some guys that, that you'd expect and some guys to keep an eye on. Some of the, you know, the expected people, DK Metcalf, number one, up above Tyreek Hill in terms of the number of vertical routes that he ran. Marvin Jones, Marquise Brown, similar names to what we've mentioned. But how about these kind of interesting ones that, that could be undervalued this year? Number five on the list, Gabriel Davis. They used him almost entirely to run the vertical stuff last year. They've made personnel changes in terms of their receiver room this year. We could see him do even more of that stuff or get more of those targets to match the number of routes that he ran. Darnell Mooney with the Bears, another guy, 151 deep routes run last year. Not a ton of targets, but could be a candidate to get more targets. Some guys, again, that you would expect, DJ Shark, Terry McLaurin, Michael Gallup. And then the number 10 name, the last guy before Calvin Ridley in terms of deep targets, uh, deep routes run, excuse me, Jalen Guyton. 
Jalen Guyton could be somebody to keep an eye on as well. Don't know what sort of radar he's at in terms of fantasy leagues this year, but an interesting name that that I definitely wouldn't have thought of. Yeah, Guyton's pretty much off the radar. He's I'd say most often not going drafted in leagues. So somebody to click the the watch button on or or use like a last round pick on. Right. If he if he's getting that many deep routes, there's a reason to believe that you know if he's getting on the field, then he could be uh, somebody that's you know the again you keep that watch button on. Yeah, it seems like that was Mike Williams in the past, but those numbers speak to the fact that it's Guyton is that deep threat, and if Justin Herbert continues to develop, he's got a big arm. Just 14 deep targets last year. Just seven of those were tar- were catchable, I and mean, he had six for 291 there. But 525 intended air yards. Coaches tend to be stubborn, even if we don't see it. Maybe that's something to keep an eye on. All right, Corey, I feel like we've thoroughly taken a tour of the fantasy landscape heading into the year. Anything you want to leave the people with before we go? No, just uh, hope you enjoyed the podcast. Some some deeper dives than you get from a normal fantasy preview podcast, but I hope it was useful. Best of luck in your drafts and most importantly, enjoy the NFL season. I know it's the closest I get these days to, to feeling like a kid on Christmas is waiting for the, the NFL red zone ticker to count down to, to the start of week one. Or Hanukkah, either way. Sure. Yes. Whatever you uh, celebrate. All right. On that note, let's sign off and get out of here. Thank you to all of the listeners. You can find us on Twitter at sportsinfo underscore SIS. You can also follow the individual sports accounts, follow us just specifically for football. We announced earlier, we talked about the new tendency reports app that's available. It's part of the data hub pro. So if you're a data hub pro subscriber, you can check that out right now on the reports drop down. If you're not a subscriber, you can try it out for free, get a one week free trial. And we've got a special discount, 20% off data hub pro subscriptions are available now through week one of the NFL season. So you'll definitely want to check that out for Corey March, Justin Stein and Mark Simon. I'm Matt Manicharian. Thank you for listening to the latest episode of the Off the Charts Football Podcast.